My son was murdered, Tion Jones, four days before Thanksgiving. And to Baltimore, he was a statistic. The, the police are not doing their job. I've invested in the city, but I haven't seen the city invest in my community. What real plan, what real plan do you have in place? We at war in Baltimore. We seeing people killed daily, each and every day. Blood has been shed all over the city due to politicians and people in office being greedy. Live from WBFF in Baltimore, this is Fox 45 News at 10. Hi, everybody. I'm Kai Jackson. I'm Mary Bubala. We just got back from our latest yeah. Your Voice, Your Future City in Crisis Town Hall. Our exclusive Fox 45 poll results show voters are frustrated, angry, and don't trust the direction in which the city is heading. We got to hear it firsthand. We at war in Iran, but we at, we at war in Baltimore. We seeing people killed daily, each and every day. A room full of people that are fed up and frustrated. It is happening in rooms all across the city, in every neighborhood. You see this level of frustration with city government. But also, I would also or, 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 argue that TJ, TJ, no, hold no on. council person TJ, or TJ, mayor or council president TJ, hold, is doing their job. Hold either. on, TJ. We can say, <laughs> look. <laughs> First, first and foremost, let me. Hold on, let him first finish. And foremost, remember, wait, wait a minute. I've because, only wait a minute, because right I, now we're starting to play politics hold on, hold and this on. conversation. We're talking. We're and talking. I don't think this is. I was fair already to talking. Wait a second. He, I know that I have to gain your trust back. I made a bad choice, and I have to live with that. Well, not only with my God, but with my family and the citizens of Baltimore. People make a lot of promises when they want our vote. A lot of promises, and once they get in office, they completely forget about all the promises they made. And this was our fifth, but as you could tell, the biggest and most boisterous town hall, I mean, St. Francis Academy, the chapel there yeah. was standing room only, Kai. It, it was packed, Mary, indeed. And, and uh, several of the candidates that you saw, T.J. Smith attended this forum. Brandon Scott, who we've been trying to get, he attended the forum. The Ruvik Naraja attended, and of course, uh, Sheila Dixon, who was former mayor of Baltimore, she attended. And Ed Norris, former Baltimore City Police Commissioner, attended. We had a lot of citizens out there. We want to let the citizens know if you didn't get a chance to speak tonight, we're going to have more town halls. But Mary and I tried to get to as many people as we could. We sure did. And we have to credit the candidates who did show up, answering some of those really tough yes. and passionate questions by the citizens. Now, we did invite Mayor Jack Young, and he did not come. But today, we released the very latest results from our exclusive Fox 45 News Gonzalez mayoral poll. Voters were asked about current Mayor Jack Young and the results show more than half of those surveyed do not trust the job that he's doing. Now to the squeegee situation in Baltimore. It was definitely one of the big topics tonight at the city in crisis town hall. Drivers stopped and sometimes attacked while they're traveling through Baltimore. Mayor Jack Young says he is trying to solve the problem. One thing about it, I'm trying to solve the problem, and that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm working hard to try to solve a problem that's been around as long as I have. Well, the problem of attacks by squeegee kids, even just them being on the corners uh, within the past three weeks. But the problem goes back even further than that, as Mayor Young pointed out. Last month, Paul Silvestri says a squeegee worker sprayed him in the face after he refused service, while another squeegee worker took his bike off his car. In October of last year, a woman says her squeegee confrontation ended with gunfire. She says she pulled out a gun when she was confronted at the corner of MLK and Washington Boulevard. The gun went off. No one was hurt. And last January, a couple says their car was damaged in an attack by someone trying to clean their windshield. Well, so far, no one has been arrested in any of those cases. But the fight to prevent these incidents from happening in the first place appears to be growing. Jeff Abel is live tonight with the latest turn of events. Jeff? Yeah, the mayor's office did launch its own plan of attack some six months ago, but there are nagging questions still about whether any real progress is being made. You know, the city's squeegee alternative plan is attempting to provide job and educational opportunity to those who are working in intersections. So far, the city has hired some two outreach workers, and the mayor's office tells us tonight it'll soon be hiring six more workers thanks to a newly received quarter-million-dollar grant. The squeegee plan that we're working on is trying to get the young people off of the corners and into jobs, and we have been successful with some. But just like anything else, you take some off the corner, more come.
So we're still trying to work that plan to make sure that not only our school system, but some of our kids should be in school and they all squeegee. And Jeff, it seems the problem of squeegee kids is something the other candidates for mayor are talking about now. You bet you heard it tonight at tonight's town hall meeting. Every mayoral candidate seemed to have a solution to this problem. In fact, earlier today, T.J. Smith even released a detailed plan to remove those kids from the intersections for good. It's some young people out there that are actually hungry, that have parents that are addicts, and they're going out to, to try to earn some money. The, now, now, I have a, a philosophical issue with us allowing that to be their way and their ends to a mean. Part of my plan is actually giving them work with dignity and affording them skills so they can learn what they're doing. A very lively debate tonight at the town hall on a problem that's still wreaking havoc in this city. We're live in North Baltimore. Jeff Abel, Fox 45 News. Uh, thank you. Other candidates talked about the squeegee kids at the town hall. Another candidate, the Ruvig Naraja, had a far simpler solution. We don't have to arrest our way out of the problem. What we do have to do is confiscate their contraband. We have to take the squeegees and the pails. New York City did this in the 1980s. They got rid of the problem. Toronto did this in the 1990s. They got rid of the problem. Why Baltimore has not done this for 40 years when it is a symbol? It is a reminder of the lawlessness of this city is under uh, inexplicable. Well, we will be back with more from the town hall throughout our newscast, so please stay with us. We have breaking news in a city in crisis. Officers respond to a traffic stop in northeast Baltimore and are dragged when the vehicle tried to speed away. It happened along Argonne Drive near Harford Road. The officers suffered minor injuries. Uh, the car was eventually stopped near Frisbee and 39th Streets. Two people were arrested. Police also seized a handgun. Well, crime was a big concern, as you can imagine, at the town hall tonight. A lot of people talked about it. The search is on tonight for a man who shot a woman inside her own store in southeast Baltimore. Police have released surveillance video, hoping someone will recognize the suspect. Keith Daniels is live in Patterson Park, where the gunman killed the woman in front of her children. Keith. Well, Kai Carmen Rodriguez and her husband have owned this store for about 15 years. Uh, it's closed tonight. The gate is pulled. The husband says they've never had any problem. But tonight, look over here. There's a memorial outside the store tonight in memory of Carmen. Someone shot and killed her. Tonight, images of a suspect and a person of interest caught on surveillance video in the murder of a woman killed inside of her own store. Someone fatally shot Carmen Rodriguez just three days before Christmas at the Kim Deli and Grocery on North Kenwood Avenue. Her husband, Derek Galen, is heartbroken. I need justice, please. That guy, whoever it was, he came in, he shot my wife in front of my kids. He couldn't, he couldn't see the kids. The kids were right there. Galen and his wife have four children. The oldest, seven years old. The youngest, a baby, just five months old. It's too much, man. It's too much. Police have released this video. In it, you see the suspect walk into the store holding a handgun, wearing all black and a mask. The person of interest wears a gray sweatsuit and a dark-colored beanie. Detectives are also searching for any leads on the suspect's vehicle, a dark-colored Honda sedan. Tonight, a husband's plea. I need help, please. If somebody knows something, say something, please. What I'm going to tell my kids now, the big one asks me all the time, where's my mother? He saw what happened, but he's confused. Well, the ATF is offering a $5,000 reward in this case. If you have any information or recognize the people in that video, call Metro Crime Stoppers. You can remain anonymous. That number is 1-866-7-LOCKUP. We're live now in Southeast Baltimore. Keith Daniels, Fox 45 News. Keith, thank you. See the entire town hall Saturday at 6 p.m. right here on Fox 45. You can watch every minute of our City in Crisis Town Hall online. Go to foxbaltimore.com. We'll see more tomorrow on the late edition at 11 o'clock. We'll be back throughout the newscast with more highlights from the town hall.
Purple Friday is starting early for Ravens fans, eagerly awaiting Saturday's big game against the Tennessee Titans. Today, hundreds gathered for a flock party today in Towson, and a larger crowd showed up for a second celebration in White Marsh. Fans say the team's 12-game winning streak is bringing the community together and giving people something to rally around. Well, some good news from the injury front of the Ravens. One of their main weapons returned to practice today. Sports Director Bruce Cunningham has more on that. Bruce? Kai, they got Mark Ingram back on the field today, but his work was very limited, just some running on the side. He's been out since last week after he suffered a calf injury December 22nd against the Browns. Right now, he's listed as questionable for Saturday night's game against the Titans. Ingram has been almost a big brother to quarterback Lamar Jackson, helping him find his way in the NFL and has been crucial to his rapid development. Jackson's a leading candidate for the Most Valuable Player Award, but has long said he's only interested in team goals, and that means winning a championship. And you know what? It's not an act. I, you know, I haven't seen anyone that's so, you know, kind of just hell-bent on winning. You know, it's, it's all he cares about. You know, when he says the only thing he win, cares about is, is winning a Super Bowl, he means that. He's been saying that since day one, and it's been so much fun to be around the guy that, you know, just has that type of, you know, type of, you know, it factor about him. Now, Ravens fans will be cheering another quarterback wearing number eight, and Morgan Atzett reports from Owings Mills. It's all coming up later in Sports Unlimited. All right, Bruce, thank you. Remember, if the Ravens make it to the Super Bowl, you'll be able to watch it right here on Fox 45. The big game is February 2nd. Kickoff is at 6.30. What real plan, what real plan do you have in place to deal with the issues of, that are plaguing this city? Baltimoreans ask direct questions of local leaders. We have their answers and more in the latest Fox 45 Town Hall. And as the wildfires continue to plague Australia, firefighters from around the globe are flying in to help. We'll go into the international effort coming up. We're taking an in-depth look at Baltimore's juvenile justice system, the impact that juvenile offenders have on overall city crime. That story coming up. Cold temperatures tonight, but much warmer air is on the way and some showers. I'll time it out for you next in my forecast. Shine. Crucial evidence that could help get violent criminals off the street is being destroyed. State data shows that it's happening in Maryland police agencies, and it's been happening for years. According to the Maryland Attorney General, 270 rape kits containing DNA evidence gathered from sex assault victims have been thrown out over the last two years. According to state data, Baltimore County has destroyed five kits in the last two years, and Baltimore City, zero at the end of last year. Activists say the report's findings are alarming. This means that there are sexual assault survivors who possibly will be deprived of their access to justice, and it means that some sex offenders could go free. The Harford County Sheriff and the Frederick City Police say the numbers cited are for several years, not two. Well, state law says the kits must be saved 20 years, and it can only be destroyed if certain requirements are met. Well, Baltimore's police commissioner is frustrated with the amount of crime taking place in the city and gave a passionate response when pressed on the issue. Here's the question Operation Crime and Justice lead investigative reporter Joy LaPola asked Commissioner Michael Harrison. How should members of the public feel safe living in the city when we're looking at numbers that are just off the charts? Well, as long as you keep reporting it like that, they're never going to feel safe because it just keeps perpetuating the... the, the the fear rather than giving comfort to them. I think we need to first look but at... isn't that what's happening at this point? Well, yes. Yes, it's actually happening. I mean, people are dying. People yes. are being shot. Absolutely. At a high rate. But you didn't ask the question why and how do we stop that and what needs to be done to change their mind about why they're doing that. Rather than when, it is what needs to be done to change the issues and root causes of why they do that and why the crimes exist. Poverty, education, housing, mental health, drug addiction, skills or the lack thereof, jobs or the lack thereof, and all of it at the same time. We have to ask that question, then say, well, what are the resources needed to fix that? Then it is when and how long. Our investigation examines the juvenile justice system and the impact it's having on crime in the city. Crime and justice reporter Joy LaPola has found there's a growing population of young adults who went through the juvenile system as kids who are now adults in jail. James Dunbar was in and out of the juvenile justice system since the age of 12. Right now, 
He's awaiting trial for murder as an adult. And he's not the only one. But here's the thing, unlike adult court, juvenile court proceedings are closed to protect the youth from public scrutiny. But it also allows anyone involved to avoid being held accountable. There are two sides to every crime. There's the suspect story and the victims. I don't like going down there anymore. It's very scary and I just, I don't trust a lot of people anymore. There is Baltimore City a place where this woman is afraid to go now and even show her face. And I said to them, you're taking my car. And they said, yeah, we're taking your car. It was 2.30 in the afternoon. So they had the gun to your head. And what did they say? They said to give me all the money I had. They took my purse from um, my arm, reached in to get the keys. And the guy who had the gun to my head at the time went and threw the keys to the other guy who came around the car. The teens got away with the victim's car her purse, and cell phone. Police arrested two of the three suspects. Because of their age, they were processed as juveniles. The youngest was 13. The oldest was 15 at the time. I believe when you stick a gun in somebody's face and try to steal their car, um, I think you should be treated as an adult. And uh, I don't think the juvenile system is the right place for you. Across the state of Maryland, the number of juveniles being arrested for violent crime is increasing. And nowhere is that more prevalent than in Baltimore City. 30% of juvenile complaints in Baltimore are for crimes of violence, compared to 10% for the rest of the state. These criminals who are out in Baltimore, they ha they're not afraid to do anything. It doesn't matter anymore. In this case, the suspects were too young to be charged as adults because they were under 16 years old. Because of that, they stayed in the juvenile system, where services are tailored toward modifying a youth's behavior. When we look at what, what is our future, then, is it that, you know, we're just going to incarcerate all African-American males and, and females, and we'll just lock them up and throw away the key? Even advocates point out there are issues within the system. It is better for young people to be in the juvenile justice system. However, there is still work that needs to be done. I feel like that's where the problem is. This carjacking victim sat through the teen's trial, and in the end, she watched both teens leave the courtroom with only a slap on the wrist, community detention. What I'm told, it just means that they're confined to their community or to their home. So they have, they have a parole officer who keeps tabs of them, like when they're leaving their house, what time they're coming home. While community detention may not seem like much of a sentence, there are many more cases where the sentences are even lighter. We found twice as many juvenile court cases that ended with probation, which includes conditions like a curfew, attending school, and following rules at home. If there's a story you'd like us to investigate, give us a call or send us an email. Our email address is crimeandjustice at foxbaltimore.com. The number on your screen is 410-662-1456. I'm Joy Lapola, and this is Operation Crime and Justice. It's time for a look at our weather. Let's check in with Vetus. Yeah, Kai, looks like we are seeing cold conditions out there tonight. A few clouds are moving in, but that's uh, going to be changing as we go through the next few days. More clouds, but warmer temperatures, and that warm air is going to be building in as we go through the day tomorrow. You'll notice that change by the afternoon. Looking at the map, we can see temperatures right now in the 30s across the state, about 29, though, in Cockeysville, 32 Westminster, 31 in Columbia. Off to the west, temperatures in the 50s in Columbus, Ohio, Charleston, and West Virginia. Cleveland even warmer than us at 51 degrees. So we're going to see all those 50s moving our way for tomorrow. And as we do that, we're seeing dry conditions, but off to the west, I'm tracking our next weather maker. That line of storms is going to be heading our way that over towards St. Louis. It's starting to pick up, and as that low pressure moves our way, it's going to give us a chance for some rain for parts of the weekend. Now, we have a big playoff game going on on Saturday. I'm going to time out for you when that rain's going to get here, and could it have any effects on that game? There's some good news, and then I'll also show you those really good news. Warm temperatures coming up. All right, Vetus, thank you. The deaths in the Australian wildfires has risen to 27. We'll look into rescue and evacuation efforts coming up. And why should we trust y'all to become mayor again? When we got kids out here, we got homelessness, but all y'all worried about is feeding y'all pockets. Baltimore City residents sound off about the problems plaguing their city in crisis. Ahead, the passionate debate at tonight's town hall.
Anger, frustration, and tough questions for mayoral candidates tonight at Fox 45's latest town hall, City in Crisis, Your Voice, Your Future. Mary and I moderated that town hall tonight. Mary. Yeah, we got back not long ago. It was a packed house tonight at St. Francis Academy with standing room only. This was our fifth town hall, and people continue to show up with tough questions for those who want to lead our city. Our panel included T.J. Smith, Council President Brandon Scott, Theru Vignaraja, Sheila Dixon, and former police commissioner Ed Norris. Crime, what to do with squeegee kids, our schools, and restoring trust in government dominated the heated discussion. But a lot of people also talked about the trash on city streets. Here's some of that. Before you can even focus on this crime, first of all, the murders ain't going to never stop. I hate to say that, and we don't want that. We want to bring it down. But you've got to cut down the grind. I can see DPW right now is a total mess. Yes. It disappoints me. Yes. The accountability's not there. I don't know if you remember, the first thing that I did when I became mayor was get on a trash truck with the guys, went out into the neighborhood because we had to clean it up. Everything has to be assessed, but I think that also we have to understand something else about DPW in Baltimore. We have to understand that for my entire life, Black neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods have not been getting the service that all the other neighborhoods have been getting, right? We know that to be true. And we have so much more from the town hall. I'll be back throughout the night with more from it. Okay, Mary, thank you. And you'll see the entire town hall Saturday at 6 p.m. right here on Fox 45. You can watch every minute of our City in Crisis town hall online. Just go to foxbaltimore.com. The Australian wildfires have burned through in an area twice more than twice the size of maryland more than 100 firefighters uh, uh, or fires excuse me are burning in the southeast part of the country and conditions are expected to get worse over the weekend um, with a heat wave followed by heavy winds now more than 1600 firefighters have been deployed ahead of the heat wave with volunteers coming in from around the world australian wildlife officials are also working on evacuating all areas where that fire could reach there will be messages going out to communities in the fire zone. If they can leave, they should leave uh, because we will not be able to guarantee their safety. Well, 27 people have died in the wildfires and several thousand are now displaced. Not to mention uh, the number of animals that have been killed. Uh, right now, the multi-billion dollar rescue efforts continue and are underway. Also coming up at 1030 tonight, Baltimore City and County are not only sharing a border, but also the problem of rising violent crime ahead, how government leaders in two jurisdictions are working together to restore safety. Short and our question short as well. Another voice. Plus, your voice, your future. Tonight, we went into East Baltimore to hear what you think are the problems affecting Baltimore. Ahead, what you had to say. And we have some big changes coming our way weather-wise. It looks like we're going to see changing temps, warming up, above normal temperatures, and showers possibly for the weekend. I'll time it all out for you coming up next in my forecast. Tonight, Fox 45 held its fifth city in crisis town hall, your voice, your future. Tonight, we focused on crime, education, squeegee kids, even police staffing and trust and leadership. Mary is back right now with more of the impassioned questions from members of our audience. Mary? And Kai, it was standing room only inside the chapel at St. Francis Academy on East Chase Street, and people continue to come and stand up for what they see is wrong in Baltimore City. They had tough and pointed questions for those who want to run Baltimore City. Our panel included a current city leader, City Council President Brandon Scott, and former Mayor Sheila Dixon, along with T.J. Smith and Theru Vignaraja and Ed Norris. And they answered tough questions about crime and the shortage of police officers. Well, there are districts right now on the, the third platoon. There were like five police officers on patrol in districts. Yep. When I was here, there were about 20. Yep. I'm talking, your districts are just not policed. There's nobody out there right now. Yeah. If someone committed a crime, be it um, marijuana charges or whatever, don't hold them back if they're a Baltimore resident from potentially changing their life and being a police officer. When you talk about Baltimore Police Department, one of the most critical things that we have to do is we have to home grow that police department. We have to get back to the days where people who are from Baltimore City are running the police department. They have to want to come here. They have to have the support of the government, first of all. Anne Arundel County just had an 80-person academy class, and Baltimore City just graduated about 20 people. That's a problem. 
Now, Baltimore City's police department is down some 500 police officers, and the police union says recruitment is also down under our new commissioner. Now, see the whole town hall Saturday at 6 p.m. right here on Fox 45. You can watch every minute of this city in crisis town hall online. Just go to foxbaltimore.com. Now, we did invite Mayor Jack Young, and he did not participate, but the majority of Baltimore voters don't trust Jack Young to lead our city. That is the latest finding in our exclusive Fox 45 News Gonzalez mayoral poll. We are recording right now. Recording a test, a test, test, one, two. G Sorry, that was clearly not our the story that we wanted to show you. Uh, we are just getting started with the results of the exclusive Fox 45 News Gonzalez Baltimore City mayoral poll. Again, we apologize for showing that little clip of an audio test. We have invited all the major mayoral candidates to see our exclusive poll results and comment. Continuing over the next few days, we will release what the voters say are the top issues and who is leading the race. Don't miss the results of the exclusive Fox 45 News Gonzalez Baltimore City mayoral poll on air online and on your mobile phone and mary let's continue the conversation about police recruitment and staffing baltimore city's police union tonight is sounding the alarm over the department's officer shortage and you heard that even from some of the people on our panel tonight they're placing the blame on city leaders according to the fop the department has 31 fewer officers than it did when michael harrison became police commissioner it also suggests Hiring has decreased since the launch of the department's recruitment campaign in July. According to the FOP, in the first half of 2019, the department hired 95 trainees. That number was 61 in the second half of the year. In a tweet on Wednesday, the FOP said, quote, when will the administration listen? Without improvements to the working conditions, benefits, and salary, the recruiting difficulties will continue, end quote. Baltimore County is wrapped around much or most of Baltimore City, sharing borders with almost all of the city, in fact. But well, councilmen representing two of the districts sharing that border also share problems. Now some leaders are trying to change the tide and are sharing solutions. Our Shelley Orman joins us with a look at their city-county collaboration. Everywhere you go, there are borders. Invisible lines we cross every day. For Izzy. My name is Councilman Izzy Patoka, and I represent the second district of Baltimore County. And Yitzi. I'm Yitzi. I'm the councilman of the fifth district in Baltimore City. Their priorities. We're really doing what I call the nuts and bolts of government. Getting back to basics for each neighborhood. Aren't far off. Public safety and really just uh, providing basic city services. Public safety, education. And neither are their districts. Well, this is the city county line. They share a six mile border. It's a piece of tape right now. Uh, but this is all one community. And since they've been in office, they're not letting the lines. Who's responsible for, you know, what neighborhoods, what areas, what streets, what roads. Get in the way. We talk to each other a couple of times a week. Their neighbors acting like neighbors. From a stream cleanup over the summer to a joint town hall, coffee with a cop. We did it right on the line. And we had the police from both sides, from the city and the county. And fighting crime. They saw a noticeable difference over the holidays with police on both sides sharing information. So we had uh, certain armed carjackings that had taken place that were nipped in the bud right away. Um, people were arrested uh, right away. They share some history. He was 16 when I first met him. Councilman Patoka was working at different levels of, of city and state government. And I was just a kid in the neighborhood who liked to get involved and help out. And similar names. We get it all the time. People mix us up by names, Izzy and Yitzy. They get calls for each other all the time. And they pass the messages along or help how they can. The lines are invisible, after all. People who live um, next to this imaginary line don't care um, who thinks they're responsible. They just want the issue resolved. And that's what we're here doing. Shelley Orman, Fox 45 News. Now you can see the entire town hall Saturday at 6 p.m. right here on Fox 45. You can watch every minute of our City in Crisis town hall online. Go to foxbaltimore.com. You'll see more tomorrow on the late edition at 11 o'clock, and we will be back throughout the night with more of the highlights from the town hall. Tonight, candidates running to fill the late Congressman Elijah Cummings' 7th District Congressional seat gathered in Catonsville in Baltimore County to speak with voters. The Ingleside Neighborhood Association held a forum. State Senator Jill Carter was among the candidates present. Cummings' widow, Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, and Kwasi Mfume were not present. 
Nearly three dozen people are running to fill the rest of the congressman's term. The special primary election is set for February 4th. State Comptroller Peter Francho has announced he is running for governor of Maryland in 2022. Francho, a Democrat, has been the state's chief fiscal officer uh, since 2007. He served for 20 years in the House of Delegates before that. He says he's running for economic, political, and fiscal reform. Well, they can expect what they know right now, which is I'm a straight shooter. I don't put my party ahead of the state. I put the state ahead of the party. No other Democrats or Republicans at this time have announced plans to run for governor in 2022. Well, we asked Maryland political analyst John Deedy about Franchot's chances in the 2022 governor's race. Here's what he had to say. Is Franchot is seen as a more conservative Democrat. People like to refer to Franchot as every Republican's favorite Democrat. And that works in a general election with independent voters. Does not work in a primary. Well, Didi says by declaring so early, Franchot has a good chance of building up a campaign war chest ahead of possible opponents. Weather. Oh, a little chilly out there, but sure. all things considered, not that bad. Yeah, not too bad, but we're really going to be warming up as we go through the next few days. Things are going to really take an upward swing temperature rise across the state. Feeling more like, like spring. Oh, I like it. Spring but it's spring. Gonna, we'll probably get rid of all the little snow that's been holding on, especially okay. the shaded side of the yes. roads. Yes. Uh, but nonetheless, that's going to be melting off as we go through the next few days. I guarantee you. Here's what's looking like out there right now. Looks like we're going to continue to see these... Uh, Temperatures increasing, which is going to be really good. Right now, we're looking at M&T Bank Stadium, where the battle's going to go on on Saturday. And there's a better forecast headed your way because there is a good chance for some rain. It's still in the forecast, but it's shifted a little bit, which may be beneficial for the players out there on the field and the folks going. We're looking at 33 degrees in the Inner Harbor. Wind's at zero, so really not too much wind factor out there, even though there's a light breeze from the south southeast. And that's kind of key because those southerly winds are going to help our temperatures go up, and it's ahead of our next weather maker that we're going to really see that boost in our temperatures going into the weekend. So looking out there temperature-wise, let's look ahead in our future scan temps. We're seeing those 30s out there tonight in the 50s tomorrow, mid-50s across the area. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. We'll probably get a little mixture of more clouds increasing across the area, but nonetheless, those comfortable 50s almost in the low 60s down on the lower eastern shore. So definitely well above where we should be at around 41 degrees for this time of year. Temperatures would be well above that. Let's go a little further here into the weekend. Take a look at Saturday in the afternoon, 68 degrees in Baltimore, 67 in Columbia, up in Bel Air, about 60 degrees, 66 in Stevensville. So definitely the model run is showing that warm push of air coming into play, and it's not going to disappear quickly into Sunday even. Look at Sunday morning still holding into those mid-upper 60s. It's going to be a mild weekend, but we'll have to deal with a little bit of shower activity here and there. So let's start with tomorrow's forecast. I'm going with mostly cloudy skies. We'll see those temperatures in those upper 40s, mid-50s, the lower 50s across central Maryland around Baltimore City, Howard County, down towards Anne Arundel County, looking at Annapolis, about 51 to 52 in uh, Severna Park, up towards Aberdeen, around 50 degrees, 49 Bel Air, 50 in Northeast, and it's still above normal as we get to the lower eastern shore, 58 in Easton, cloudy skies in Trap, looking at about 57 degrees, so not too bad for tomorrow. Bigger picture with our changes. Here's that next weather maker on the move, off to the west. Dry conditions along the I-95 corridor, but as we look further west, you see the frontal boundary building in, bringing in those showers over St. Louis. That's what I'm going to be timing out. That's the key for this weekend. As you look at that moisture trying to build in on the future scan, 8 o'clock tomorrow, rush hour, just some clouds. Coming home, just some clouds, mostly cloudy for the day and through the afternoon. But here comes that rain building in as we get into Saturday morning off to the west. But I'm watching this little batch of rain. Could it work its way into Baltimore? 8 o'clock game time. The bulk of the rain is still off to the west. That's the good news. The heavy rain is still there. But as we get a little closer, it's not arriving until really Sunday morning. Now, could there be a little drizzle or a spotty shower ahead of this front? Possibly. So that's what I have in the forecast for the game. So stepping out of the shot here, you can see Saturday's game kickoff. I'm thinking of, it would probably be mostly cloudy to cloudy skies, 59 degrees, mild. And then halftime will be 59. I think clouds out there, could there be a little mist, a little sprinkle? Possibly. But I think the heaviest rain is south and west of us still. As you get wrapping up the game, there could be a shower in the neighborhood. But as of now, it looks like the main bulk of the rain is going to be through the overnight after probably midnight. So I'm going to hope uh, that that stays true. We'll continue to monitor this closely. But 
but right now looking better for the game as far as those showers being widely scattered or just a little bit of drizzle until late tonight uh, of that night getting that line of rain. A closer look at your seven-day forecast coming right up. All right, Vitas, thank you. Everyone knows that green tea is healthy, but some experts are saying it could actually extend your life. We'll take a new look at their study coming up. New information is coming to light on a possible Iranian threat. We'll share what the president says he believes caused the U.S. jetliner to be shot down. Prenatal vitamins marketed as free of heavy metals. But who's really policing what's in the bottle? We're talking about something as precious as the future of kids. I'm Lisa Fletcher for Spotlight on America. Tomorrow on Fox 45 News at 10. After all. Now to major developments regarding the situation with Iran. President Trump has indicated that he doesn't believe mechanical issues are the cause of that commercial airline crash this week that killed 176 people, including 63 Canadians. Now that's fueling speculation that perhaps that plane flying ta from Tehran to Ukraine was taken down by a rocket or missile. Sinclair's chief political correspondent Scott Thuman is in Washington with new information. Well, this is only ratcheting up the tensions, but now multiple news agencies are reporting that U.S. officials think it's highly likely that an Iranian missile brought down that Ukrainian jetliner. And somebody could have made a mistake. Uh, some people say it was mechanical. I personally don't think that's uh, even a question. U.S. officials reportedly believe that if Iran fired on that jetliner, it could have been an accident, an errant missile launched just hours after the initial onslaught that Iran fired at U.S. forces stationed in Iraq. Meanwhile, warning systems like those that helped prevent American casualties in Iraq are vital. Senator Ben Cardin of Maryland credited the Defense Special Missile and Aerospace Center based at Fort Meade, Maryland. It was their work that detected the uh, missile launch uh, by Iran that allowed us to protect our troops and our resources. And we now saw what it means in, in real life. It, it saved lives. A year ago, President Trump visited one of the bases just hit. Nobody is even close in terms of our equipment. We make the greatest equipment in the world. And overall, he's opened up the bank. Military spending increased 16 percent from 2016 through 2019. And in the budget approved last month, the Pentagon will get $695 billion. Retired Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis says the American military is still on top, but costly wars have left it vulnerable. We have not modernized our forces and our force structure in decades, despite what some claim to the contrary. We basically still have the 1940 construct that we designed to go into World War II, while the rest of the world, especially Russia and China, they've actually modernized. China! A concern likely only to grow, as tensions do too. In Washington, I'm Scott Thuman. The House of Representatives and lawmakers passed a War Powers Resolution Thursday. That resolution is aimed at limiting President Trump's ability to use military force against Iran without congressional approval. That was insulting. That was demeaning to the process ordained by the Constitution. And I find it completely unacceptable. They gave us the most uh, general conclusions about threats uh, to the United States. But when it came to any specificity, it just wasn't there. Well, the vote was split mostly along party lines, with only a few representatives voting across the aisle. It moves on to the Senate. Today, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell rejected House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's request to release details about the president's impeachment trial and proceedings. Speaker Pelosi has yet to hand over the impeachment articles to the Senate and said that they must first release the framework for the trial. The president has implied that he may still want a wide range of witnesses at his trial, including House Intelligence Chairman Adam Schiff and Hunter and Joe Biden. Do you listen when I speak? I said when we saw what the arena is that we would be sending members in, then we would send over the articles. We haven't seen that. Well, this morning, Representative Adam Smith tweeted his belief that Speaker Pelosi should release the articles, but later said that he misspoke and supports Pelosi's decision. Get the latest on the Iranian conflict and the impeachment information with Fox 45 News app. Install it today and search for WBFF in your app store. 
We have an update right now to the form of candidates in Catonsville tonight on the people vying to replace Congressman Elijah Cummings. The candidate's widow, Maya Rocky Moore Cummings, and Kwasi Fume were in fact in that forum tonight, so I misspoke earlier. Uh, the special primary election is set for February 4th. And time for a detailed look at your weekend forecast. Here's a look at their forecast. Looks like we're going to see pretty nice conditions with those temperatures warming up as we go through the next few days here. 51 degrees tomorrow. Feeling pretty good. Above normal where our normal high for this time of year is 41. Cloudy skies. But then as we get to Saturday, I'm going to call it mostly cloudy as we see those showers pushing in a little later. That's the good news as we have a big game between the Ravens and the Tennessee Titans battling out down at M&T Bank Stadium. I'm going to give it a 30% chance for showers moving in late. About an 80% chance as we get into the late hours. I think we'll probably hold off that rain to the overnight. That's the latest model runs. I'm feeling pretty confident about that. Looking at Sunday morning, still some showers early morning, but holding on to 66 degrees. Not looking bad there. On Monday, 54 degrees. And as we get into early next week, temperatures in the mid 50s. So that means we're still running temperatures above normal. Loving these temperatures as we get into the weekend. Back to you, Kai. Betis, thank you. Mark Ingram back on the practice field. But if he can't go, his backup is more than ready. Bruce Cunningham has the tales of Sports Unlimited. When the Ravens hit the practice field this morning, that familiar number 21 was among them. For the first time in over a week, Mark Ingram was out there, increasing hopes that he will play Saturday night against the Titans. During a portion of practice we couldn't shoot, Ingram worked on the side, just doing some running and light drills, but he was out there. Ingram injured his calf on that play against the Browns December 22nd, sat out the regular season finale as a precaution, and then tried to practice last week before suffering a setback. Today, his first time back since then. On the official injury report, Ingram is listed as questionable. It was limited participation, so that's what uh, that's the definition of it. So we'll see, see how it goes. Now, if Ingram can't play against the Titans Saturday night, the Ravens say Gus Edwards will more than fill the role. And here are some numbers that might convince you of that. Ingram sat out the season finale against Pittsburgh, and Edwards responded with 130 yards, a confidence builder for the coaching staff. Running behind Ingram this season, Edwards compiled a respectable 711 yards. And here's something you'll like. Ravens fans will be honoring another Ravens quarterback who wore number eight, Trent Dilfer will be honored as the Ravens legend of the game Saturday night. Dilfer, of course, helped lead the Ravens to a 34-7 victory in Super Bowl 35. He went on to play for Seattle, Cleveland, and San Francisco before starting a long career at ESPN. Towson hosts Drexel in a CAA matchup, and Morgan Ansett reports from Owings Mills. That's all new at 11.30 as Sports Unlimited continues. Bruce, thank you. Newly released data from the CDC shows that the youngest person to die from the vaping-related lung illness in 2019 was only 15 years old. Across the country, more than 2,600 people have been hospitalized due to vaping illness. The median age of those who have died is 51. The number reported, number of illnesses reported, has declined since stricter vape and e-cigarette legislation has been enacted. Researchers believe that the main ingredient in vapes is what's making people sick. It's vitamin E acetate. Well, lots of people know that green tea is healthy for you, but now some are saying that can actually prolong your life. Researchers in China examined more than 100 people over 70 years and found that those who regularly drink green tea live longer. They say that particularly for men over 50, drinking green tea every day makes one to 20%, makes it one to 20% less likely that you'll die from heart disease or stroke. Well, thousands came out to Las Vegas this week to check out the latest tech innovations in the 2020 Consumer Electronics Show. Several safety devices were featured this year, including a wearable alarm clock that senses sleep apnea, a virtual caregiver through a tablet. Sensor detecting homes were also a big trend this year with ceiling sensors that can detect acute diseases and strokes. Now, the technology is really incredible, but several worry about protecting privacy. The security privacy risk for any of this stuff really just depends on, on the companies and, and being able to ask very clearly, what are you doing with my data? Well, some companies have already have models out to look at, and others only had plans to be produced within the next couple of months. Nothing stinks about this toilet device coming up. 
We have a bathroom invention that's powered by your smartphone. If you've ever wanted to reach us, no matter where you are, now you can on a new local channel called Stir Baltimore. The Stir app is available on Roku, Apple TV, and Amazon's Fire TV. When you first open the app, pick Baltimore to start watching local programming. Stir is owned, by the way, by a subsidiary of Sinclair Broadcast Group, the parent company of this station. Among medical devices debuting this week at the 2020 Consumer Electronics Show, a robot designed by Chairman Toilet Char excuse me, Charmin toilet paper stood out. Get my words a little twisted there, folks. The Charmin robot is controlled via smartphone and is designed to bring a user toilet paper if they find themselves on the toilet without any. This is a wonderful invention. It is connected through Bluetooth. The two-wheeled robot stands upright at about eight inches tall and can carry a fresh roll of toilet paper right to you. 